and I'll introduce you. Um, folks, thank you all for tuning in this evening. We're going to be talking about Backyard Ducks 101. I know that we've had some interest in our county. Uh, we, we've always had the backyard uh, chicken uh, producers, but we've got a lot of people or a few people moving more into the duck side of things. And uh, I'd ask uh, Billy Ward, who's an extension agent in Johnson County, Tennessee, if, if he would talk about Backyard Ducks 101, and he graciously agreed to do so. So Billy, thank you, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Awesome, thank you. All right, I'm gonna start sharing my screen, if you would. Just let me know that it's showing up and looks like it should. I had some trouble with this the other day, so we're going to try to – can you see that? Anything yet? Nothing yet. Nothing yet. Let's see. There we go. How about now? Awesome. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Okay. Okay. All right. You should be seeing old, our buddy Donald Duck there. Yes. Yep. Awesome. Okay. Great. So, yeah, so thanks for having me. My name is Bill and I'm from Johnson County, actually from Johnson County, uh, Tennessee here in Mountain City and the a and r and 4-H extension agent. And I'm excited to talk about ducks. As I was telling the gentleman before, I thought I knew a little about ducks until I started preparing for this presentation. And so I think um, there's a lot to be said for adding some backyard ducks to your farm, to your home, and I hope we answer some questions that you might have. So feel free to stop me at any point, uh, pop something in the chat. I'm sure Phil or some of those guys will be able to uh, bring those to my attention if I miss it. Um, but without further ado, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. So <clears throat> I started this really thinking about my first experience with, with backyard ducks. And I don't know how many people have been to the Appalachian Fair in Gray. We had just a few weeks ago, but they have a little um, barnyard nursery and they have a little miniature grist mill and the little baby ducks walk up a ramp and then they slide into the mill pond. And it's the most popular attraction I think of the fair. And all of a sudden we see this little bump in kids, particularly wanting ducks and baby ducks. But when we go around and start asking about, are you ready for ducks? Uh, what does it take to raise some ducks? Oftentimes they don't know. We have a lot better understanding of maybe raising chickens and what that looks like, but not so much on backyard ducks. And they're very similar, but there are some unique differences that we'll kind of talk about a little bit. So uh, probably one of the most interesting things is that all, and I say all very loosely because we know that can be uh, kind of a little bit too black and white, but Really, all ducks are going to be des descendant and back to the wild mallards. Uh, mallards are native to Europe, Asia, North America, and North Africa. And they began to, particularly in China, to domesticate ducks several thousand years ago. Um, and as you see this little duck genealogy, all these different breeds of duck all will go back to the mallard duck, which is really interesting. Um, they have a variety of unique traits. Uh, in appearances, but they will all go back to mallard ancestors. Asia was a particularly important part and region for early development uh, of duck breeds. And there are some reasons for that. I know this is kind of backyard ducks, but I think some of the historical perspective is really interesting and important. Um, so as you can see that in, in Asian, particularly in the Pacific Rim, ducks evolved along with the cultivation of rice paddies. Um, and they continue to be, even we think of uh, modern agriculture, and industrial agriculture, both small uh, farmers, what we consider small farmers, but also very unique, some organic rice farmers in this area, particularly in Indonesia, uh, China, and Japan, continues to use ducks um, in the rice paddies for a number of reasons. One is they help control weeds and pests 
in those patties. Um, they don't bother the rice plants though, because rice plants have a, uh, an abrasive silica in the leaves. So during that early transplanting period, those ducks, as you can see, will go through those flooded patties and they're pulling out slugs and other pests, uh, insects, both um, vertebrates and invertebrates that can be damaging to those rice plants. Now, when the rice begins to head, when that grain head begins to form, they have to pull those ducks out because they will eat the rice, but they've been doing this for thousands of years. Uh, one study I looked at said there are still over seven and a half million ducks employed in Thailand in rice patties today. So um, a lot of ducks, a lot of ducks at work, and I just thought that was super interesting. Um, the Netherlands was also an important place for the evolution of duck breeds. <clears throat> so uh, this is on the, on the one side of your screen, the colored. Uh, those are polders, particularly in the polder country of the Netherlands. Polders are, are really vast farm fields that have been reclaimed from the sea. Uh, those are drained using dikes. And as you can see with all that water, that's a great place to have some ducks. Um, they used a lot of uh, fishing was a big industry and continues to be in the Netherlands. And they found that ducks were a great almost byproduct. Uh, they could use a lot of the uh, waste from the fisheries, fishing industry uh, to feed the ducks. And they were pretty low maintenance, uh, providing meat, providing eggs and things like that. Um, and as you can see that, that black and white is a great old photo, uh, particularly before World War II, the Netherlands is one of the world's most important uh, regions for uh, really duck raising on a commercial scale. And some of the duck breeds that we'll talk about later, uh, they may have been, particularly the Khaki Campbell was kind of developed in the UK, but in the Netherlands is really where the development of that duck would come from. So I thought that was interesting. Um, and then of course, in the UK, um, they love their ducks. They love their ducks. So the Aylesbury duck, all these are pictures of Aylesbury ducks. Um, Jemima Puddle Duck, the famous book by Beatrix Potter, is a, an Aylesbury duck. And again, before World War II, duck was a very popular menu item uh, across the UK. And again, that would go uh, by the wayside during World War II. Um, but just some historical perspectives of the importance and really the um, widespread uh, practice of raising ducks on both on a small scale, but also on a more commercial scale. Interesting to note, Jemima Puddle Duck, if you haven't, you know, read any Beatrix Potter lately, uh, really talks about the premise of the book is she wants to raise her own eggs. She wants to brood her own eggs. And we'll talk a little bit about why that's important later. So just some fun historical perspective. <clears throat> so it really begins to, if you're interested in ducks, and we will kind of talk about some reasons you might want to have some, but if you want to get started, what does that look like? Where do you find really good quality breeding stock or uh, where do you find ducks? So this progression of pictures, uh, the first one is you see a, a Muscovy hen. We got to talk a little bit about Muscovies later. Um, and this is a little, uh, some ducklings that she hatched. This is from our farm. We have two or three uh, Muscovy hens and they regularly hatch little ducklings that we enjoy watching. So they're really broody. They're a really nice waterfowl to have. Um, but oftentimes, most of your commercial ducks uh, and the ducks that you can find, I should say domestic ducks, lack broodiness. So it's a bit of a problem if you want to hatch your own. Um, you can actually use uh, muscovies as surrogate mothers, surrogate broody hens, you could say, to hatch some baby ducks. Um, but you can also, and there is a practice of using actual hens, this picture in the middle. So that's actually been used on a small scale. If you have a good broody hen, uh, she might be willing to hatch some duck eggs for you. Now, they may take a little bit longer. It takes 28 days for a duck egg to hatch. And sometimes those eggs are so big, the mother chicken, uh, the broody hen, has a hard time actually turning those eggs. Because as we know, in an incubation uh, under the hen, whether that's a chicken or a duck, they have to turn those ever so often. So if they're a little bit big, you might have to help her, uh, but that's not an uncommon thing, actually. They have a good broody hen raise some duck eggs if you have some fertile ones. The last picture here 
And I have to admit that we were, um, my first experience with ducks is uh, we wanted some ducks. I was a young kid and we found some ducks on the, uh, you know, in the trading paper here local. And we went and these folks had found some, uh, some wild mallards and they had the mallard ducks and you, they would sell you some young mallard ducklings. They kept several around and they sold those as a sideline. Um, so if you want some ducks, don't you don't do that. <laughs> um, mallards are protected by the Migratory, Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918. So it's illegal for any person to take, possess, or purchase any part of a mallard duck. Uh, that's including nests, eggs, um, or the ducklings. Um, you know, even active nests with chicks, you cannot touch or destroy them without a permit. And it's going to be very hard to get a permit. So don't think you can go out and, and kind of domesticate some mallard ducks, even though we know most of our domestic duck breeds are genetically from the mallard. Uh, you can't do that. So we were like breaking the law majorly uh, at that point. Um, so, of course, the next obvious place you may find uh, some ducks would be a hatchery. And that's a really great place, especially if you have a couple of hatcheries that you are familiar with. Um, and usually they're really good about answering questions and having a lot of information online. Um, and they always usually have a very wide variety. If it's something you're particularly interested in, you may want to start and order those early. But a couple of drawbacks are they're going to cost between eight and $15, that's a rough estimate, um, per duckling. And that's usually for the hens, the little drakes will be a little bit cheaper. And straight runs where they just swoop up, ducklings without sexing them will be cheaper as well. But you're gonna look at 18 to maybe $15 or more, depending on the breed, and you will have to have a minimum order. Uh, depends on the time of year when that, what that minimum is. Sometimes that's 10, I've seen it as 15, uh, and I've also seen it as 25. Uh, one hatchery I looked at actually today said they would ship you two, but the um, shipping was extremely expensive. So that's something to consider. Uh, how many, you know, we could talk about that, especially when we get to the feed store. Your local feed store may have, I know Tractor Supply often has some baby ducks. Uh, your local feed store may have some. And that's another good place. They'll be able to answer generally what hatchery, what major hatchery they came from. Uh, you'll know how long they've been there, and you can get one or two or as many as you want. There's no minimum. As a general rule, I've seen some feed stores with a minimum, but most don't care. They're just glad to sell the ducks. But you really, you don't want to start with less than three or four. So they do like company. I like most things. Um, they do flock together, so they're going to prefer the company of other ducks. So you want to try to get at least, I would say four would be a minimum before you get started. Um, and then the last picture is at a small animal auction. So of all the places other than the collecting the wild mallard duck eggs, um, a just kind of a plain, basic, unregulated small animal auction may not be the best place. Um, and that's for a variety of reasons. Uh, you may not know the um, health condition of those birds. You may not know where they come from. You may not even know the age. So if you have a relationship with someone that's selling ducks there, or maybe the, uh, the auctioneer, or maybe you have a really high quality animal sale, or uh, we have a lot of chicken sales with our 4-H across the state of Tennessee. We don't have many um, duck projects for our poultry projects. I wish we did, some more waterfowl. That would be a great place to, to, purchase, some, uh, to purchase some starter ducks. Um, but generally you want to shy away from auctions. If you do, and we can talk about some biosecurity measures, if you do purchase anything at the auction, you're gonna to wanna to keep those animals separate for really two to four weeks. You wanna put those in a nice place that you have that's clean, that you can clean afterwards, and you're gonna keep them separate from any other poultry you have on the farm for at least two to four weeks. So just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, at an auction, you really don't know what you're getting. I just lost my page there. Let's see. Okay. So let's say that you do like most of us and you buy some baby ducks from the hatchery 
or at the feed store, what does that look like? Thankfully, if you're familiar with raising chicks, it's gonna be very similar. Um, when you start, they don't need a lot of space. They need about a half a square foot, but after about a month, they grow very quickly. They're gonna need up to about two square feet per duckling in your brooder. Um, they grow so quickly and they actually have a little bit more cold tolerance than baby chicks. Um, and you can kind of see there, I've seen anywhere from 90 to 95 degrees for their starting temp. But usually you're gonna to wanna to put either a infrared heat bulb as you see on one side, where they can get under there and they can uh, stay warm for the first week. And then you can lower that temperature by five degrees every week. Now on the other side is something that's becoming more popular and that's a plate. I've heard those called several different things, a heating plate. And it's really nice because it kind of replicates what that mother hen would do. Those little chicks can go under there. And as they grow, you can raise that progressively higher. Uh, they say that they can regulate their heat a little bit better. Um, there's less of a fire hazard with these heat plates. Um, and they're just a, a really nice thing to try if you're ever interested in that. Um, and, and really what I would say to people similar to raising chicks is really observe. So if your ducklings are huddled in a tight bunch, uh, perhaps under the heat lamp, that means it's probably too cold in there and you should lower that light or you should try to get some more heat in there. If the little ducklings are scattered to the outside of your brooder, and we'll talk a little bit about what that should look like, they're probably a little too hot. So they're trying to get away from that heat. So you may want to adjust that light again. Um, so really observation and a lot of agriculture, we talk a lot about uh, data and methodology, but observation goes a long way. So just kind of being uh, observant and watching those ducklings and seeing how they behave um, will go a long way. So we can talk about what that brooder looks like. Um, usually we like them to be round, very similar to chicks. So there's no corners for the little ducks to either crowd into uh, or get stuck. Oh, my screen sharing is paused. Um, I don't. So anyway, I had a thing that my screen sharing is paused. Phil, are we still uh, sharing screen? I was just about to send you a message. It looks like uh, we're still seeing the slide that says getting started continued. It's got the okay. three, three photos on it. Okay, let me, uh, let's back up here and shoot, try again. I'm not sure why that did that. How about now? You should see a picture of uh, I see brooding and yeah. well, I see the entire page. It's, it's the, not just the one slide. I see your advanced okay. slides. On How about page. that? Yes. Awesome. About okay. Mm, technology. So uh, anyway, so your brooder, you can see a picture here. Um, this little brooder is probably going to work for a little while. We don't really know how big it is, but we can see some problems. Um, first of all, uh, we can kind of look at that feeder. Ducks are messy. Uh, even as little baby ducklings, they're going to be kind of messy. They use a scooping action where chicks uh, and chickens will kind of peck, but ducks will actually tend to scoop that food up. So they tend to be and need some more space and they tend to waste a lot of food. So in the beginning, you're going to want about two inches uh, per duckling and you're going to expand that after a couple of weeks to about four inches linear space of feeders. Um, a lot of people, particularly some larger growers will use um, hopper feeders so that feed continually, uh, gravity feeds downward so they can continue to have that at all times. But just kind of make, uh, make a note that these ducklings are gonna be pretty messy. Um, and kind of something that we like to talk about as well, and we'll go ahead and just kind of do that. Uh, many people get the mistaken idea that because they're ducks and ducks love water, that they should have access to water immediately. And unfortunately, that's not right. Um, ducks in the wild and even ducks that are hatched by a hen, not a chicken, but a hen, um, they will regularly dress those little ducks, little ducklings with oil. So they have some water protection and they're able to go out in water. I know the muscovies that we have on our farm, after sometimes the first or second day, we'll see them swimming in some water. But ducklings you purchase from a hatchery or some other place, 
they don't have that ability yet. They don't have that oil coat. Uh, they just have that down, which is very susceptible um, to getting wet and getting those little ducklings chilled. And you're going to want to wait three to four weeks at least before you allow those ducklings access to any type of pool or something like that. Now, the problem is they're going to want it. So you can see this water in this brooding picture. Um, it's going to work for a little while, uh, especially these are very young ducklings, but they really like to dip their heads. They like to, as you know, they like to dip their heads and they're going to want to get in this as soon as possible and make a mess. Um, so this is probably those little ducklings first couple days uh, at this farm. Any type of water you have that's a stand will need to be best elevated uh, with a wire mesh box, perhaps, so that water can drain and really keep that at a height, kind of at level with their back. Um, now, that is to say, they actually need water and quite a bit of water, clean water, to help uh, flush out their eyes and their, their sinus cavities to a certain degree. So they're doing that, they're looking for that water to dunk their heads in and their, and their beaks for cleaning, but we just have to kind of keep in mind that they will also get in there and foul that water very quickly if we allow them. So just a, a drinker like that, where for chicks that might work um, until they get out of the brooder, you might need something a little bit larger for the, for the little ducklings, for sure. Um, and also feed. I know uh, just checking our feed stores that if I went and I bought some ducklings today, the feed stores in my county do not have any duckling specific feed or waterfowl feed, we might say, because they'll use the same similar feed as they would for geese. So I don't have a slide for this, but really if waterfowl feed is going to be pretty protein rich at 20 to 22%, and you're going to use that for a few weeks, and then you're going to move to about a 16% grower ration, uh, and then most breeder rations are going to be about 15%. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about feed later. Um, but if you have to substitute for chicken feed, you want to be sure you get an unmedicated starter and grower um, for a number of reasons. One, uh, just the label. If that label says it's for chicken, um, then we want to always go by what the label says. But also, ducks can have some adverse reactions to the medications put in that feed. Uh, we know for uh, a variety of, uh, of chickens and brooding situations, we want to go ahead and uh, be proactive and feed them some medicated feed, oftentimes to keep them healthy. Um, but with ducks, we actually can't do that. If you do find a duck feed that's medicated for waterfowl, that would be okay. But if you ever need to substitute with some chicken feed, you want to always use unmedicated feed. So uh, <clears throat> ducks like to feed in a group. So um, duck feeding is usually very sociable, and they're Aside from the grain and corn uh, that you might feed, you don't want to be feeding corn for, and you only really use that as a treat after they get older. Uh, we don't want to use bread, um, but they are excellent foragers and they're excellent with um, some insect control. I don't know if you're very familiar with Elliot Coleman. Uh, he's wrote several books about extending seasons and four seasons gardening. And he has, a, in one of his early books, he talks about ducks going into the garden after the harvest. Um, as a lot of his greens because they will really clean up that with slugs and things of that nature. But we also have to be careful and think about food safety. So we don't probably don't want ducks in our gardens cleaning, especially our greens, cleaning those bugs and slugs out of there while we're harvesting. But afterwards, it's a great thing to do, or at least to consider. So after about five to six weeks, and you can get that temperature to about 70 degrees ambient temperature, those ducks are ready to go outside. Now, one of the really nice things about ducks is they really require uh, very minimal uh, housing. So I've just got three random pictures I stole from the internet today. Um, some of these are better than others. And we can talk, we're gonna talk about that a little bit. Uh, primary considerations, you're gonna want some type of shelter. They are very weather hardy, but you want some type of shelter um, and you want that really well bedded and on high ground that drains well. Um, kind of this picture on top, that's nice for a couple ducks. Um, 
I think it looks like that you could probably move that and get in there and gather some eggs. The picture in the middle, uh, that looks like it may be even attached to this duck pond on the right. Um, very basic shelter. They look like it's well bedded. There's probably a duck nest in there. And then, of course, we often think about ducks, um, you know, around ponds, or around water, uh, maybe streams and things like that. And absolutely, that's a great way to do it. We just have to remember that, one, they will probably need some protection from, from the elements, but particularly from predators. Um, you know, that, that saying a sitting duck, it talks kind of about hunting, um, but ducks can be uh, easily and quickly wiped out by things like foxes in particular. Um, in ponds, um, we're looking at more aquatic predation. Um, I've heard of large catfish with the ducklings, but also even large snapping turtles will get those ducklings as well. So that's definitely a management decision. If you have a large turtle population, snapping turtle population in your ponds, ducks may not be a great fit. Um, if you have a creek, they might be an excellent fit uh, and, and something nice, but we also have to remember about nutrient loading and about those banks. They can kind of wear those banks out a little bit, um, coming in and out and they do um, can make a bit of a mess. So if you have a really pristine pond, maybe a small pond, uh, I, I know some folks have some backyard ponds and they have some koi and they thought they would add some ducks and um, it, it kind of made it a bit of a mess. So just something to, co to consider. Um, they need minimal housing, but they do need some predator protection. The house on the right, I think is probably the best option, at least at night, and we can talk about that but there's no bottom. So when we think about raccoons, even foxes, things that might want to prey on our ducks, a building, a structure that has a predator-proof uh, bottom or floor is going to be very important. Health considerations. Ducks are pretty healthy. Uh, that's one reason they've been uh, widely adopted in many places, but there are some things we need to look at. Um, they don't generally have a lot of parasite issues, um, and a lot of that is because they're often raised uh, on the home flock side in small groups and have plenty of range uh, to go. They don't, they, they don't do well in confinement, which is one reason after World War II, uh, we see a big shift uh, in poultry, as in chickens, uh, versus ducks. Uh, chickens can handle confinement a little bit better than ducks. Ducks just generally uh, don't always do well. Some breeds are better than others, but given plenty of room, uh, a lot of green space and forage, and a good floor, uh, good footpath uh, will go a long way. So what you might see is this first picture is a picture of bumblefoot. Um, ducks are aquatic. Well, aquatic is, is poultry, uh, waterfowl, and their skin is not as tough as a chicken. So flooring, such as some wire flooring, um, even hard packed earth, concrete, um, rocky places, uh, that, that skin is actually pretty thin and it can have, uh, you can get some cuts, you can get some abrasions, and then of course you end up with some infections and you can kind of see this bumblefoot, um, kind of an infected callus that comes up. Um, you know, that foot pad also, they need some, they need some water, some moisture. Uh, concrete in particular is very hard because it tends to dry them out. So as that thin skin gets dried out, they are more susceptible to lots of, of foot problems. Their legs and their feet, um, and really thighs and legs can be a little weak the first few weeks. They grow so quick. So you're really going to watch, especially as ducklings, um, what the bottom of your brooder looks like. And even on up to your... Um, your pecans in particular can have some foot and uh, thigh problems depending on how they're raised. So uh, well-drained areas, grassy areas is really a great uh, way to do that. Uh, when they're in confinement or maybe in their duck, duck house, uh, you know, you want to really, uh, nothing less than about a four inch litter, about a good medium grade. And that can be, of course, uh, corn cobs if you can get them is great. Uh, but most of the time we're going to be thinking about um, pine shavings. Uh, straw works as well too after they get a little bit older, uh, especially when we're talking about adult ducks. But you want to always keep that bedding um, dry and clean as possible, which is really a challenge sometimes with these ducks. 
the other, the duck kind of giving you the bad eye there, um, is that's called sticky eye. And that can happen for uh, really because they're not, don't have access to good clean water to kind of flush, um, kind of flush those eye infections out and kind of keep that clean so they don't get infections. Um, their sinuses, interestingly, run down the back of their head. So oftentimes, if you're having eye issues, you may be having some respiratory issues as well. So you really want to be sure they have access to good clean water. Again, which is a challenge because they do tend to be pretty messy. Um, but if you notice any type of stickiness around the eye, any type of matting, redness, uh, things like that, uh, you can do a saline flush. And if that doesn't help, uh, along with access to clean water, you know, that might be a problem uh, you consult your vet with. So uh, those are two of the main problems you might see. Uh, but really with the research, um, we don't see a lot of problems with ducks as long as we really tend to um, kind of those basic needs, good food, clean water, and plenty of space. And when uh, we do have to confine them or the space that we give them, we want to keep that clean, grass covered or in a deep bedding situation. Um, one more issue you might see, um, ducks are pretty gregarious and they will eat or at least puts in their beak almost anything. So you can have some impacted crop issues. Um, what that is, that's gonna get something in their crop and if string, even long pieces of grass, uh, real stemmy grass and hay can do this. Um, twine is actually, again, we know leaving twine around the barnyard is a bad idea, but they can ingest that um, and you will see some swelling there. And again, that's a, a def a definitely a problem that you might want to address. So, so then we have to think about, so all these reasons we talked about um, some historical uses for ducks and maybe we could have started out with why we want ducks in the first place. Um, but I think that's the more fun part of this presentation. So if you're thinking about ducks, why is that? And there's a few reasons that you may want to. Um, most of us probably don't have any rice patties, but I'd say a lot of us do like eggs and then maybe we like to eat ducks. So we'll kind of talk about those as well. Um, something that many people don't realize, and Phil, I got a real kick, uh, appreciated all the things you were posted on your Facebook page um, about how many eggs uh, ducks lay in comparison to chickens. Um, good commercial producing, uh, commercial ducks can outproduce most commercial chickens in the number of eggs they lay in a year. Um, some of the top uh, ducks can raise, and, or should, should I say lay, uh, between 300 and 350 eggs a year. Um, so that's going to be at the top of production. Many of our backyard flocks won't quite do that, but we know um, some khaki Campbells, which we'll talk about, um, number one top um, selection for your backyard. Um, they can lay an egg a day for almost 10 months. That's not uncommon. So especially when we think about wintertime, and how chickens often will uh, maybe slow down their egg production. Uh, a duck, given some adequate light, um, they can continue to lay those eggs. Uh, so that's, you know, I think reason enough for a lot of people to have them. So you can have a more uh, a constant supply of eggs. But the eggs themselves, um, you know, I've read a lot of different things uh, and talked to some folks. Um, duck eggs can be slightly more nutritious uh, they say a lot's going to depend on what they're being fed. Um, they have some omega-3 fatty acids and the albumin, right? That egg white, we might say, um, is really great for bakers. Uh, they really love that. Um, our local vet loves a, a duck egg sandwich, but he likes the whites. So that's what he, he's a firm, he has that every morning for breakfast when he can find duck eggs. Um, so uh, I kind of got a kick out of that, but um, duck eggs are bigger. Um, so when the, I know recipes, when they call for maybe uh, two to three chicken eggs, you might be looking at maybe one duck egg, depending on the size and the grading of that. Um, duck eggs and chicken eggs have very similar protein, uh, types of protein in there, but those proteins are not identical. And we know some people that sell duck eggs to individuals who are allergic to chicken eggs. 
Um, so sometimes if you are allergic to chicken eggs, you can eat duck eggs and vice versa. Um, I know here in Boone, uh, or actually in Mountain City, so just across the state line in Boone, they have a really uh, thriving farmer's market. And I think uh, duck eggs are going for about five to six dollars a half dozen. And right now they cannot keep up with supply or demand cannot keep up with supply. So they're very popular for people, uh, both who love to bake, who might want a bigger egg, and for people who can't eat a, a chicken egg. So that's fun. Um, so the feed for ducks, if you're laying eggs, is going to be very similar, um, again, to what maybe you'd be feeding chickens. Um, but if you can't find anything, they're going to find a lot of their basic nutrition out foraging if they're allowed to do so. But a good um, complete duck feed, uh, along with some uh, uh, oyster shell and some grit and some limestone, will keep your eggs coming, uh, particularly through the winter. Um, kind of the bottom there uh, is, is roasted duck. Uh, a lot of, I know people that eat um, regularly, they love duck liver and goose liver, and I know some folks that enjoy duck as well. In America, we don't eat a lot of duck. The last statistics I looked at said we eat about a third of a pound per person. Um, so that's really very negligible. But in the United States, we raise around 30 million ducks a year. Uh, we don't do a lot of that here. In Tennessee, uh, a lot of that's in Indiana, Pennsylvania, California has quite a few duck farms. Um, and if you've never tried it, I would definitely um, recommend you do so. Um, it's going to be stronger. It's a little fattier than chicken. Um, it's a little bit more akin to a, a darker meat. Um, and it's really, uh, really a great protein to try if you've never tried it. Um, I would recommend you follow a recipe if you've never done it before. There's a lot more fat. And that fat in particular is prized in particularly French cuisine and different, uh, again, some chefs. Um, but you have to kind of know how to handle all that fat in that skin uh, before you put one in the oven for Sunday dinner. Um, for sure. Uh, if you're interested in raising some of your own protein, um, they compare very well to the Cornish Rock Cross chicks that most of us like to raise for meat. Um, with a good feed regimen and healthy birds, in six to eight weeks, you're going to have about a, uh, you know, four to eight pound duck. I know that's a big range, but it just depends on the breed you get. Um, and you're looking at a pretty nice feed conversion uh, and at about a 65% dressing percentage. So um, the, 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 the problem might be, I've talked to, to, to some friends of mine, some farmers that have raised ducks. They love the ducks. They love to um, prepare the ducks, but you have to process those ducks pretty early. Uh, and we're looking at between really before, you know, around 10 to 16 weeks, depending on the breed. Because as those pin feathers begin to, to sit, you might say, uh, they get much harder to clean. So if you wanted to keep that skin, um, it's a little bit harder. They do have some, um, I know some people that use like a wax, a hot wax. They'll kind of dunk that carcass in a hot wax and be able to peel that off and most of those feathers come out. Um, but also many people will just go ahead and skin those ducks if they want to uh, consume that. So as, as that, we'll kind of talk about some of the breeds you might see and that you might want to try. And there are all kinds of breeds. Remember, they all go back to the mallard, but there are many, many differences. So I think, I know for, for most of us, other than the wild ducks, we think of the white, the just typical white duck as the Pekin ducks, um, really our go-to. And of course they are from China. They were first introduced in the US in 1873. And with a good feed regimen, you're looking at a seven pound bird in seven weeks. Uh, really very tender and succulent meat. Um, kind of the, again, the Cornish rock of the chicken world. Um, but if you just want to keep some around, they're, they're a fun duck. They're a very vocal duck. Um, so um, they are fun and they lay, they like quite a few eggs as well, big white eggs. So they're, they're a fun duck. Um, if you're more interested in egg production, um, there are some hybrids uh, that we can talk about, but just kind of that are commercially available, the Khaki Campbell. And I think you can see very clearly right there how they still very closely resemble the mallard. Um, developed in the UK, uh, the Netherlands did a lot of work in advancing the genetics. So again, we're talking 250, 300 plus eggs a year. Um, they are not 
typically very broody. Pecans can go either way, um, but they're a good dual purpose. They do make a good meat bird as well. Kind of the problem with some of these, and it's not really a problem, but um, pecans are pretty, pretty sociable. They're kind of nice to have around. They're pretty calm. The khaki camels are a lot more active. They've been described as uh, flighty and very light, uh, which is important if you want to do some, some of the activities we'll talk about. Um, so that's something to consider, not only your purpose, but also the ducks that you would like to have around as companions. So the khaki camels, a little bit more nervous, a little bit flighty. The Indian runner duck. You know, I know when I first saw some of these, they just didn't look real. Uh, sometimes they're called um, penguin ducks, and there's all kinds of terms for these. So they, again, are really good egg layers. If you get a strain that's been bred for that. Um, some of them are really just bred for the novelty of the duck. Um, they run, as you can see in the name, they run rather than waddle, and they can run pretty fast. They do not fly, right? So if you're thinking about... Um, how to contain those. Um, the pecans, you can use a small fence, a short fence, probably about two feet tall if you don't have any predators. And the Indian runners are gonna be about the same. You wouldn't need a very tall fence at all to keep them in. Um, so um, a lot of colors and really developed in Indonesia. Um, and they're just kind of fun. Now, curiously, and maybe not too curiously, they lay eggs, but they don't build nests. So they tend to just lay an egg when the spirit moves, you might say. So um, if you have your ducks out free ranging all day long, uh, even at night, it might be hard to find those eggs. Ducks, unlike chickens, ducks are a little earlier risers, you might say. Most ducks will lay eggs within the first three hours after sunlight. Chickens will go up to five. So if you have a, a, a few little backyard ducks, a little backyard duck flock, for predator and safety reasons, it's really nice to go ahead and put them in secure housing for the night. And then about three hours after daylight, you can open those doors, you can let them forage the rest of the day. And most of the time those eggs will be there in a nest. Um, if you have something like an Indian runner duck, they're just gonna be laying on the floor. They won't make a nest, but it makes the eggs a lot easier to find if you do keep those ducks up at night and then let them out about three hours or so after daylight. So, so they're a fun, a fun uh, variety to have. Uh, another is gonna be the crested ducks. And you see, I picked this particular image because there are all different types of colors. Um, so really, again, this is a genetic mutation um, that you might find in several different breeds. Um, and it's really been bred for this. Uh, and we know that as early as the 17th century, we have pictures of crested ducks or some like to call them top knot ducks uh, in the Netherlands in some Dutch paintings, which is really interesting. Um, this, this crest is actually a malformation of the skull. So there's a void there. So that void is filled with fatty tissue and those feathers that grow within that fatty tissue have these characteristics are gonna to be tall, um, kind of light and wavy and very much different from the feathers that are around them. So it makes them really, really stand out. So, but the problem is that due to that genetic, uh, you might say um, variation, they sometimes have some health problems. Um, coordination uh, can be a problem with some of these um, and they do not breed true. So where these other breeds oftentimes uh, will breed true, unless you have like an F1 hybrid of, of something, we can talk about some of those. Um, crested ducks do not breed true. Uh, it's, it's really interesting, and there's some numbers uh, I can kind of go over, but if you have two crested, uh, a drake and a hen that lays eggs, one quarter of those eggs will not be viable. And really, um, you're looking at one third to a third of those baby ducklings having that crest and being able to pass that on. So most of the time, most of our crested ducks will come from hatcheries and they're kind of a one shot deal. And uh, you can use them, you know, some are, are pretty good egg layers. Um, usually we don't see them much consumed for meat. They're more of a novelty, something nice to have around the yard, uh, something that's fun, fun to have. So just a couple more, um, and I just picked these because I think these are beautiful ducks. 
Uh, these are Welsh Harlequin ducks. They're a fairly new breed uh, developed in Wales between two off-colored khaki Campbell. So really it's a khaki Campbell um, that just kind of has that black bill. You can sex them as ducklings by the bill color, which is really interesting. Um, they're active foragers. They make some of the better mothers um, out there uh, and they're a calm breed and good layers. Um, next door here is we have the Cayuga duck. And that is the only breed that's been developed in the United States um, up near the Cayuga Lake in New, in New York. So again, it's a dual purpose, um, 12 to 16 weeks. Um, they're gonna reach their market weight, but they're pretty good layers as well. Um, just a couple more. I think this is one of the more interesting. We talked about the importance of the ducks in the Netherlands, and this is a Dutch hook-bill duck. Um, again, they started breeding these um, with this specific trait. They're kind of on the rare side now. You don't see too many of them, um, but they're just a very interesting duck um, that if you wanted to go into to, um, you know, duck raising, the Livestock Conservancy, the American Livestock Conservancy, would love to have some more uh, breeders of some of these rare breeds, and that one is listed. Um, and then the, the last one most of us might know is the muscovy. Now we've been using the term duck and you've seen a few pictures of muscovies and there's some debate about it, but a, a muscovy is technically not a duck. Um, it's a South American waterfowl. It, we have to remember all of our domestic ducks are descended from mallards. And then we have a few wild species of ducks, but most of those are found in the Northern hemisphere. Muscovy ducks or muscovy waterfowl uh, are actually native to um, South America. So it looks like a duck. If you've ever been around them, they behave more like a goose uh, and they kind of, they'll roost like a chicken. They're, they're a very unusual um, uh, animal to say the least. Um, their incubation period is 35 days rather than ducks 28 days. So that's something to be uh, aware of. They will breed with ducks and you will get what they call mules. And those are some in, those are actually most of the time infertile, but just like we think about um, horses and donkeys creating mules, um, you can have a muscovy and a Pekin duck in particular will make a mule. And that's actually a very popular um, breed to have in, in France for their meat production. So just some interesting things. There are mothers are generally excellent. Uh, the fathers are, the males are very large. Um, but they will all have this, this fleshy growth on their face. They, uh, some are more prominent than others. Um, so uh, that's just something to kind of kind of keep in mind. Um, they're a nice beginner. Sometimes they're called a dry land duck. Um, they're a nice duck to have or waterfowl to have if you're just getting started. Um, but beware, they will reproduce rapidly. So um, you could be uh, inundated with ducks or Muscovy waterfowl uh, in a short period if you're not careful. So, you know, then we go back to, so, you know, kind of why do we want to have some ducks? Uh, this gentleman here was like the most proud man I've ever seen with his handful of ducks that he's showing. Um, there are exhibitions that we've talked about, so that's always fun. Um, and then there are, um, ducks are used in border collie training uh, and demonstrations. Uh, we went to the Grandfather Mountain Highland Games this past summer, and a large part of the uh, herding dog demonstration was with ducks. So um, there's a lot of things you can do uh, with ducks. They're great for eggs. They're great for meat. Uh, if you wanted to do some exhibition, uh, maybe even start a 4-H poultry project using waterfowl, they would be excellent for that. Uh, you can use them for um, herding demonstrations. They're probably a little easier to transport and maneuver uh, than sheep. So we, um, so I think that's kind of funny. Um, and then as we close, uh, a lot of people uh, have asked, you know, chickens versus ducks. And, and I think this is a funny little picture, but in, in reality, they complement each other pretty well. Um, so generally they coexist pretty well. We don't see a tremendous amount of disease and parasite crossover. We just kind of want to be very careful what comes in and out of our flock. We don't want to be buying chicken at an chickens at an auction, ducks at an auction, and, and mixing all these poultry uh, breeds and species uh, from different places as a general rule if we can help it. Um, but it's a nice, uh, you know, they're a nice addition. 
if someone wanted to get started with a small backyard flock and wanted to even try to raise some, one drake to five or six hens is a good ratio. And that's a, really also a good ratio. If you have those five or six hens, um, you really only need kind of one nesting area uh, for that. And, um, and you should be you should be good to go. So kind of with that, um, I just like to open up if anybody has any kind of questions or comments, um, I'd love to try to try to answer those. And I will uh, stop sharing here. Billy, thank you very much. Uh, any questions for? Uh, yep. Hi, Billy. This is Patricia from Mountain City. Um, hi. Yeah, hi. Uh, is there a problem with visiting your docs <laughs> so I can see what I would like to do with uh, raising some? Abs yeah, absolutely. You'd be welcome to come. We have a little. Uh, we have some what we call some teenage uh, muscovies that are looking for a new home and then we have some about two weeks old ducklings that just hatched that are kind of taking over the barnyard so we they uh, yeah you, you'd be absolutely welcome uh welcome to come and one more question is okay. when, I, when i took the farm tour that was the early summer they one of the farm ladies said that it was better to actually get your chickens later on in the season so that mm -hmm. you don't have to put them under incubators. Mm -hmm. So it, would that be the same for ducks or? It really depends on where you're keeping those. So, um, you know, they really like it though. That first week, they like it pretty warm. You know, uh, one thing I read said 95, one said 90, and we're looking at kind of uh, four to six inches above the ground. So if you get baby, uh, any kind of baby fowl, maybe in July or August when it's very warm, they may not need more than a, um, you know, a, a, just a little supplemental heat at night because they can't really um, adjust, you know, adjust their, you know, moderate their, their body temperatures yet. And mother ducks and mother hens will keep them under wing for quite a while, especially in the evenings. So it really just kind of depends on the time of year. Um, and you know that sometimes we can be really hot and dry, and then sometimes it can be kind of cool. So mm -hmm. those first few weeks, um, some supplemental heat. That's why that um, that brooding plate, that picture of that brooding plate, is really nice. They can kind of go in and out of that as they need to. Mm -hmm. as, okay. you know, it kind of mimics that mother. Yeah, that mother, that mother hen. Mm -hmm. Right. Thanks. You're welcome. And uh, Bill, you had a question in the chat from Jen uh, asking uh, your thoughts on ducks for pest control. Yeah. So, you know, there's been a lot of, um, particularly in, in Asia, they talk a little bit about it. The research that I kind of looked at for the United States, there's not been a tremendous amount of emphasis put on that. Uh, we have a lot of, um, I've seen them kind of go through, our muscovies go through our garden and pick some, definitely pick some insects. Uh, sometimes they'll take a sample of a vegetable uh, every once in a while, which is not great. Um, but some of the, especially when you look at some of the folks and practitioners of permaculture and some of the more um, maybe non-traditional uh, gardening that we look at, I think they're an excellent option. Um, it's just really going to depend on if you're looking at vegetables. Um, you know, honestly, they're going to they they make a lot of waste. So if you're having them in your vegetable garden, you, when we're looking at um, pathogens and trying to keep our, our vegetables, especially leafy greens and things that may be growing low, um, clean as possible and separate from any type of really just, you know, let's say just waste, um, it's probably not the best. But again, after the harvest is over, um, you know, chickens and ducks, ducks in particular are a really good option if you could pin them in there and they will eat a lot of those um, adult and larvae, depending on what you've got. They love, they really love slugs. So, um, but also we know in our, maybe leafy greens, like our spinach sometimes, if it's kind of cool and wet, slugs will get on our spinach and the ducks will take care of them, but they're gonna also be in their, you know, in our vegetable crop too. So I think for that, um, they do a better as a cleanup crew after the harvest, as a general rule. Um, for sure, but now for maybe some vegetables that are a little bit higher growing, uh, maybe even beans and things like that, I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't think that would be. Uh, I think they might be effective, but I haven't tried that one or seen it. Any, any other questions? If not, uh, Billy, thank you again for an excellent presentation. My uh, my twelve year old daughter was one of those uh, young ladies who picked up uh, four ducks at our <laughs> fair, <laughs> and she uh, she's been a trooper for it. You know, she's really really do, done a good job taking care of them. But she, as she was watching your presentation, she said, "I can look at those pictures and I can smell those ducks." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and that's something I really should have went a little uh, more in depth on, but I knew time was kind of short. Um, they're, they're pretty messy. You know, they're really very messy. So when we think about housing and areas that we're going to keep our ducks, you know, well draining and good bedding and regularly changing that bedding is pretty important. Uh, so especially if we can't get them out and, and out in where, uh, you know, in pasture or something like that, where we're not going to be you know, stepping up all the time. Right. I had a question, Phil. I wanted to ask if it's true uh, what they say about ducks and June bugs. <laughs> <laughs> I had to ask. Do they? Yeah. Do they like well, June bugs? Well, honestly, we have seen, uh, and I don't. We it's it's one of the funniest sites because usually they don't get in too big a hurry. We have the muscovies right now. And they will chase low flying insects. They will give it all they've got, you know? So uh, it's, it's pretty funny. Yeah. I, I have one more question. Sorry about okay. that. Now, I wouldn't mind raising ducks because I'm, I'm from France and I love to eat ducks mm. and I'd like to make duck confit and all the, the good thing, ways to eat ducks. But I'm a little bit um, a, a chicken to kill them. <laughs> So is there a place that I can take, uh, that I could just take them for a ride in the car and say goodbye? I am not within, I would say, driving distance of, of us here in Mountain City of a facility that is certified licensed to do any type of poultry. Mm. Uh, a lot of the reason for that, we can go into some of that is, um, you know, Tennessee and I think probably Virginia, and I won't simply speak about Kentucky, um, there's USDA exemptions for um, on-farm processing of poultry for direct sales. Um, so, you know, most of our poultry uh, in the United States is going to be um, coming out of large, larger operations and then backyard operations and people that may sell at farmer's markets or do it for home consumption are able to do it at home. Mm. So there's really not, uh, I would love to know if, if, if some of you guys out there would know if there are any uh, poultry processing facility. I will be glad to look into that. Um, and see, because I do know um, in Washington County, uh, outside of uh, right there in Jonesboro, there are some, there's a place that is the, um, and I forget the name of it now, but they, it's a local food hub. It's almost like a grocery store. Um, and I can't remember the name of that. Um, but they sell um, a variety of local meats and produce. And there are people there that have chickens. And I think that chicken is vacuum packed and processed somewhere. So, um, if they do chicken, if there's a place to do chicken, they might they might do poultry. So or other poultry. So I'll look into that. Um, let me know. I have your Boone Street Market. Yeah, that's what it is. Thank you, Jen. Boone Street Market. Okay, great. We'll check we'll check into that. Just uh, let me uh, be sure I have your uh, contact information there. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, great questions. Thank you all. All right. And and if there are no others, again, Billy, thank you very much for, for this presentation. It's been, been great. Um, and for anybody who wants to join us on Thursday, on Thursday evening at 6 o'clock, we're changing gears a bit. We're having a presentation on fall caterpillars by one of our master naturalists, Chris Allgaier, a very good amateur uh, entomologist. We'll be talking about some of those caterpillars you may encounter in the fall, whether it's in your yard or garden or in the woods. Uh, so that'll be Thursday at 6 p.m. Uh, Chad and Jeremy, any any comments from you all? Great stuff, Billy. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah. We'll have to put him in the rotation regularly, Phil. Yes, I, I agree. 
I agree. Uh, maybe something on snap beans next spring if, if we're still doing this. I yeah. Know. He's uh, written some things on, uh, I think, the history of snap beans in, in mm -hmm. eastern Tennessee. So. Yeah. All right. Well, well, thank you all, and I hope everybody has a good evening, and we'll go ahead and, and close it out. Thank you.